Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's, um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, having sat down there uh, a few times when I was a student here, it's a real shock to me to be up here. So uh, thank you very much for having me back. It's a real honor to be um, speaking here in front of so many uh, bright and brilliant students, no doubt. Has much changed since you were last here? Uh, quite a bit has changed. Um, I have a lot more white hair. Um, the, the town, strangely, looks a lot more organized than I remember it being, but that's probably more um, myself, um, less so of a disheveled student, but uh, it hasn't changed that much, I have to say. And coming here, I mean, literally, uh, the memories came flooding back, so it was wonderful. Well, uh, speaking of change, Saudi Arabia is going through some fundamental changes, particularly in the form of Vision 2030. Could you begin by sharing with our members what Saudi Arabia's vision is um, and why now is the time to realize that? Uh, certainly. Um, so Vision 2030, uh, if you read what's, what's in our um, really quite impressive presentations, there's a lot of information, a lot of highlights, a lot of great words, a lot of great terminology, but if you are going to crystallize it into its very basics, which I think is important, it's about um, quality of life for the individual, not just the Saudi, but quality of life for all those who are living within Saudi. And that's very important because it, it covers everything. It's the environment, it's the economy, it's culture, it's social, it's uh, legal, you know, justice, it's literally everything root and branch from the country. But more important than that, in order to achieve that, you know, many issues like the climate, it's not just about the climate in Saudi. The, you know, you can fix Saudi as much as you want, but if the climate's terrible everywhere else, it's terrible for Saudi. So it's a very expansive uh, vision that seeks to provide a quality of life for the individual. And the way it's basically set out is for the human being. And I think that's an important element that sometimes doesn't come out in some of the flesh, but it's about making human lives better. And in terms of transformation from an oil-based economy, uh, what are the, some of the other economic areas that Saudi can really compete with the powers around the world? Well, our hope is to compete <clears throat> in all of them um, as much as we can. The ambitions of the vision are incredibly high. Um, whether we are able to achieve all of them, I don't know, we're going to try. But the, our leadership's vision is to say, look, there is nothing to stop us from achieving a particular level. And the only thing that holds us back is ourselves. I remember my aunt once telling me, I came home from work before I was an ambassador, upset about um, a regulation or something in, in Saudi that, hadn't, that was holding back my company. And I was telling her, you know, this is so silly, nothing here works well. And she said, you know, the only thing holding you back is yourself. You and your generation think you are from the less developed world. You are as developed as everyone else. But until you realize that and behave that way, you ain't going anywhere, basically. So it's about setting the ambitions. And I, I'm genuinely, unbelievably honored to see so many young Saudis here. When I was a student here, there were three of us. Um, now we have four Rhodes Scholars. I mean, it's a remarkable change, and it makes me so proud as an ambassador. They're our best ambassadors. Um, so that's high ambition. We will get there, hopefully, but we want to compete on <clears throat> every front possible. And how do you think Vision 2030 has changed Saudi's international outlook? Quite a lot. Um, I mean, to some extent, you know, the culture of Saudi Arabia historically is we are a Bedouin culture, essentially nomadic tribal culture. And as nomadic tribal people, part of life is adaptation. Part of life is um, survival, dealing with the circumstances that are in front of you. And survival in Arabia, I can tell you, um, historically is complicated and difficult. And you can see that best um, uh, the best example of that is how many great civilizations that have risen and fallen or come through the Middle East and how many have decided to visit us in Arabia. Very few. Alexander swept right past because he thought too difficult. 
the Byzantines and the Persians were on our borders, and they both said, no, thank you very much. Um, the early Islamic civilization, which rose up in, in Medina, it took one generation before they moved to Damascus. So Arabia has only been important twice in its history. At the initial inception of Islam, and then when oil became valuable in <clears throat> the early 70s, and now we're at the center of the, you know, the world's attention. So for us, it's important to be outward looking. Now, as a result of no one coming to us, we were fairly uh, closed society that basically dealt with each other. And to be fair, for the majority of that time, we were happy with that scenario. Um, but we are a, a curious people. We are interested people. Um, and anyone who's met some of the Saudis that are here, I would take the advantage of spend some more time with them. They're a fantastic bunch and quite fun. We are a cheeky people at times, but um, we are adaptable. And I think we're adapting to the world that we live in. And if you look at the last 100 years in Saudi Arabia, where we were and where we are is a pretty remarkable development. Um, my grandfather used to go to work on horseback. My father flew fast jets in the Air Force, and I have a cousin who was the first Arab Muslim astronaut in space. So that's three generations of change, which are pretty remarkable. And Saudi Arabia is, you spoke about the individuals. Saudi Arabia is often criticized for clamping down on freedom of expression, the right to protest. Um, do you think there's more need for systematic cultural reforms to transform Saudi's outlook? Um, anyone who says they're in a perfect place is kidding themselves. We can always improve and develop um, and enhance where we are in Saudi. The, the last five years have seen some pretty dramatic and remarkable changes across the board. A lot of them have been reported, a lot of them haven't. Um, not surprisingly, because many of them are domestic issues that don't really concern other people, or they're not particularly interested, so you've heard um, or you will have probably read in 2018, we allowed women to drive for the first time, uh, which is an interesting one because it's seemingly so innocuous and minor, yet it's a huge cultural shift in the country. Um, and for, uh, people underestimate how big of a deal it was because it was a challenge not just to um, some of the religious conservatives, it was a challenge to how people had been brought up thinking that things should and would be always. Despite it being quite ridiculous, it was a big deal. And it was a, a fault line where people were prepared to pick that as a subject to fight over and to argue over. And one of the things that has happened, so women started driving, uh, the world did not collapse, um, God didn't crack open the earth and swallow us whole. Rain and fire didn't, rain of fire didn't land on Saudi Arabia. People woke up and said, well, hang on. If that's okay, what else is okay? What else should we be allowed to do? What else should we choose to do? And I think what you're seeing with our government today, um, principally because it's a much younger government than it's ever been in the past, is a, a, a bit more of a push. now. That's not a criticism of the change in the past. It's just at a different pace because it's a different time, a different requirement. I'm 44, uh, which probably sounds quite old to a lot of people. It used to to me when I was sitting there. I'm older than 80% of the country. 40% of our population is still in school. That means they're not in the real world yet. And when you look at that population dynamic, the world that we need to begin creating today is totally different from the world I grew up in. And I think that is what has begun accelerating the pace of change and why we're looking at things um, so intently. So in Saudi, another small issue that people have never really uh, reported on, we have changed probably 250 laws in Saudi, and that's either revoked, removed, uh, evolved, or replaced. That's a huge amount of, of change. And that's only about 20% of the way through the process, as far as we're concerned. We've changed maybe 2,000 different regulations. Um, these are root and branch changes. And, and they cover everything from um, you know, basic rights of, of women to the labor markets to silly regulations, who can own a company, 
Um, we're opening up the country in every fashion. And essentially what we're doing is saying, look, we used to be a country that insisted everyone did something in one way. And I'll get back to the reason why we did that um, in a bit. To a country that says, this is what we think, but it's your choice to pick the path that you want to take. And that is a big step for us. It's a big change. And let's go back to why uh, you think Saudi evolved in, in the way that it did, why you had that mindset. So part of being a, a, a nomadic society in a harsh climate, and um, Arabia is one of the, we're a country the size of Western Europe with no permanent overland bodies of water, no rivers, no lakes, no ponds. Some develop when, when it rains, if we get a particularly heavy rain, but there's zero overland bodies of water. Survival is the only driver of action historically in Arabia. So what does that mean? You live in a tribe, you basically move around looking for water. Where there were settlements, they're settled around um, oases or wells, big wells, or coastlines where there's, there's trading. And the mentality that develops in that kind of society is a survival mentality, which means the group is all important. Um, the individual is irrelevant because the individual may cost the group their lives. Um, so individualism is considered reckless. Individualism is considered thoughtless and selfish, and we must all work together in order to survive. Now, what, you're, what you've seen in the last 50 years in particular is we are move, we've moved away from the survival mentality. And the culture has changed. Because you no longer have to survive, you don't need to live by those rules. But the mentality doesn't change overnight. And the younger generation coming through are different. They're not so survivalist. They're just as adaptable, but they have a different way of looking at things. And it's totally shifted the way um, the younger generation, the younger populations just look at life and what they demand and what they want. Now, there's still a little bit of um, the old mentality left over in that. You don't change everything overnight. And what we're intent on doing is uh, playing a bigger role in or, or allowing the population to decide the direction it wants to go. In the past, it was a, let's not go too far. So in 1956, I think, in the mid-50s, we opened our first girls' school in Saudi. And for the first year, it was in a mountain village uh, called Taif, town, on the west coast of Saudi Arabia, near Mecca, if you know uh, the geography of Saudi. And it had one student for its first year. And she was the daughter of the headmistress. We had protests in Tabuk, in Riyadh, in Jidda, in Dammam, in Asir. Why, how dare you open a girls' school? Girls shouldn't be studying. Now, how did eventually we convince people that they should be studying? And this is the interesting argument that was made. Well, how can you expect the mothers of your children to teach them how to be a good Muslim and a good Arab if they haven't learned in school? Ah, uh, well, then that's okay. And slowly, slowly, it became accepted. Today, 60% of our students in Saudi are women. Um, some of the most accomplished researchers in Saudi are women in sciences, in arts, in culture. It's really remarkable, this change. But again, it's about give them the opportunity, let people see it's fine, and then let them make the decision rather than forcing them to. And that's why sometimes we're a bit slower than, than we'd like. Um, other times, right now, and this goes back to your question earlier, the pace of change in the modern world is so fast, we have no choice but to make the changes we're making now. We don't have time to wait because, frankly speaking, if we didn't start making the changes that were required, particularly economically, there wouldn't be a Saudi Arabia in 20 years. And I, that would be a disaster that doesn't uh, bear thinking. And do you think that Saudi has done enough to convince the rest of the world that this change is happening. You, you're right, we have seen lots of changes in the last 20 years. No, we haven't. Uh, frankly speaking, I think we are sometimes our worst, our own worst enemy in that, again, part of our cultural norms is we don't talk about ourselves. Um, we are very insular in that sense. 
And if you're not talking about yourself, no one's going to voluntarily find out, particularly in, in the modern world where information passes so quickly, um, where social media plays such a big role, where people's uh, patience to read and find and search for knowledge is much less than it used to be. People want the quick information, they move on to the next piece of information. We need to be doing a better job of getting out there, of talking about what we're doing, of highlighting what we're doing. When I first arrived as ambassador here, I was asked, what is it that you want to achieve? And I said, I want to take the last 40 years of facts about Saudi Arabia and correct them, because they're wrong. And the problem with wrong basic facts, and it's a lot of little things, it's not one big thing, that when people analyze what is Saudi Arabia, the analysis may be wonderful, but it'll end up in the wrong place. And the more analysis that's done on bad information to start with, the more analysis that's going to be incorrect, the more people have a real misconception of what Saudi Arabia is. And, and that's unfortunate and a shame. We're not a perfect country. Um, we have plenty of problems, but we are not what most people think we are. And that, I think, is very important to change. And on that note, Saudi Arabia is an important player in the Middle East, a region that's seen uh, years of conflict. To what extent do you think it's right to point fingers at Saudi for the instability? Well, to some extent, um, <clears throat> we all bear responsibility for the world we live in and the region we live in. I think that instability in the region is not totally our fault. Some of it is circumstance. Some of it is based in things that happened one, two, three, four hundred years ago, even longer in some cases. Um, but certainly we have a responsibility to our region and to what happens there. I think that a lot of the problems we're facing, you know, we can share the blame with others, but it's not solely uh, on Saudi Arabia's shoulders. We are probably, we're the largest economy in the region, one of the more powerful countries militarily. Population-wise, we're about middle going. But the political importance of Saudi Arabia, not just as a big oil-producing nation, but as the home of the two holy sites, Mecca and Medina. You know, people forget part of our constituency is the whole Muslim world, not just the Saudi population. So much of what we do in Saudi and the decisions we make is we make decisions and take into account what Muslims in Indonesia think, in Malaysia think, in Pakistan think, in India think, in Canada, Washington. It, all around the world, there are Muslims who look at Saudi Arabia to be doing the right thing um, religiously. And that is a very large constituency to, to have to live up to, um, particularly when you have your own population that you have to care about as well. Um, so yes, we bear a responsibility by the virtue of living in the region. But if you look at the history of Saudi Arabia and the direction it's taken politically and particularly um, in the region, we are a very much a country that believes in non-intervention in other people's affairs. Whether it's right or wrong, you have quiet talks with other people about what happens, but you don't get involved willingly or openly. And that may be a mistake, but it's just the way we are. And it's been seven years since Saudi Arabia got involved in Yemen. According to the Human Rights Watch, the Yemen conflict has resulted in the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, what responsibility does Saudi Arabia take for this crisis? Well, again, uh, by virtue of being involved in it, we have uh, a large responsibility. And we try and live up to it in some of um, what we're doing in Yemen. Now, it's important to bear in mind how we got involved in Yemen, because a lot of people don't realize this is not our war. Um, the conflict started basically with Yemen splitting up and um, a group from the north, the Houthis, taking over probably 80%, certainly of the population, where the population live in, in Yemen, mainly in the north. The conflict between various Yemen tribes, groups, and parties um, goes back long before Saudi Arabia existed. In fact, in the 60s, we were supporting the grandfathers of the people we are um, in combat against today. They were our allies. So things move quickly in the region. And the southern Yemenis were supported by Egypt. And Egypt was bombing Saudi Arabia from Yemen. So I mean, the whole thing has twisted on its head. 
because it's a complicated conflict and it's a complicated region. But we are trying to do, I mean, I genuinely, and I, I can say this because I've been involved um, in some of the discussions, I don't know anyone who has consistently tried to bring the conflict to an end more than Saudi Arabia. Now people say, well, why are you still carrying out bombing raids? Because the conflict exists and um, we're trying to stop attacks on Saudi, we're trying to stop um, various things from happening and the shift, a big shift in control in Yemen now would be a disaster for the conflict. It would become never ending. And you can't simply walk away from a conflict that doesn't stop it. Um, Afghanistan is a good example of what happens sometimes when you leave something. It doesn't mean that that creates a better scenario locally. Sure, it might be better for you when, as the country that left. It may be better for Saudi Arabia to, to pull out of Yemen, but it certainly will not be better for the Yemeni people. In particular, because we would probably do less positive things in addition in Yemen. So for instance, in the last five years, we've cleared 380,000 mines. Um, we've delivered more food and medicine to Yemen than the Yemeni population could eat. Now, where it ends up and how it gets lost, that's the problem with conflict. In conflict, bad people take advantage of the situation. And that's when things get worse. And then you end up in a, a vicious cycle of it getting worse and worse and worse. The best solution is to end the conflict. But in order to end the conflict, you need both sides to play and both sides to agree to stop. Um, so sure, we bear a responsibility, but I promise you we are trying as hard as we can to bring a political solution around. Well, Human Rights Watch has documented at least 90 apparently unlawful Saudi-led uh, coalition airstrikes on Yemen, including alleged deliberate attacks on civilians. Where does Saudi stand on that? I mean, I would dispute the number with Human Rights Watch, and actually, you know, it is difficult to know exactly how many um, accidents happen. And the reason I call them accidents is there were definitely, particularly early on, some very, very big mistakes that were made and some poor planning uh, in, in some of the conduct of um, the military action. So what we did in the coalition is we set up what's called GIAT, the Joint Incident Assessment Team. And it's made up of a group of lawyers from the coalition states um, who are there independently of governments, so they don't report to the governments. Um, they write their own assessments. And I, I can tell you, I've tried to communicate with them. And the first thing they tell you is to go away. We don't report to you or talk to you. Um, you can read what we publish when we publish it, which I think is positive. Now, what people don't know is that as a result of GIAT and their investigations into some of the, the um, um, uh, whether it's bombings or, or you know, actions that are deemed um, unlawful, we have carried out punishments against, you know, people have been jailed, um, uh, reparations have been paid, there's still more, in, more uh, assessments happening. So it's not a question of something bad happened and we did nothing about it. We've recognized that things went wrong and that we had deficiencies in how we were um, conducting our campaign. Now, on that, I have to say that one of the most important roles that um, you know, some of our allies in the West have played is improving how we conduct the campaign. And without that role, we would not have improved the ability to conduct campaigns that only address military targets, that, that don't um, cause more damage than is necessary. So it's an important role that our friends have played with us in improving what we're doing, and as well keeping us in check and you know not letting us um, make the mistakes we've done uh, made in the, in the past. But interesting to, uh, point to make is Saudi Arabia has never ever in its history got involved in a war um, proactively. Even our involvement in Yemen was there through UN resolution to, re to, to protect and defend the democratically elected government. So it is not in our nature to go out and get involved in places, which is why we didn't have the skills to carry out the, the, um, the campaign. And long term, does Saudi really have an exit strategy from Yemen? Uh, yes, and the war. Um, 
our hope is that sense will prevail and we can get both sides talking. That again, to be fair to um, the Yemeni government and the other big player, which is the Southern Transitional Council, they have ag agreed on a number of occasions to a sort of negotiated settlement. And the one side that refuses to agree are the Houthis. And even when they signed Stockholm, it actually was very um, positive development. And that was at the time when Hodeida, which is the main port in the northern bit of Yemen that was under Houthi control, and it was laid siege to by the, the um, some coalition, but mainly Yemeni army uh, soldiers. And war in a city is on a different level to war on an open field. And nobody wanted to see that campaign continue. So when it was suggested by the UN, we go to Stockholm and try and work out a solution to stop Hodeida from ending in a really bad conflict zone, both sides agreed. And they agreed on a set of rules and regulations of what to do with Hodeida, about how the port is managed and how to share the revenue from the port. Now, what people often, when you talk about ending a conflict, people forget to look about the long-term effects and the knock-on effects of one thing over here. Something like a ceasefire in Hodeida, what happened as a result? All of the Houthi troops that were in Hodeida, ready to defend it, left Hodeida, moved up north, and then laid siege to Marib, to another. So the conflict didn't end, it just moved from one place to another. Um, now, when that happens, the Yemeni government turns around and says, well, why should I ever have a ceasefire with them? Because if I give them a ceasefire here, they're just going to move their troops somewhere else, and that spurs the conflict further. So th the solutions to these kind of issues are not easy, and you have to try and look at the knock-on effects of what happens when you stop. So doing the right thing may not always be the right thing. And let's talk about Saudi's relationship with Iran. There are talks going on between the two regional powers now. What does a, relation, a good relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran mean for the Middle East? I mean, it would virtually end the majority of problems in the Middle East. Um, and while I obviously I'm not just a Saudi national, I'm the ambassador and a, a member of the royal family, so I'm triple biased, if you like. Um, but it's not Saudi Arabia that's aggravating that problem. And the best example for that that I can give is that from the inception of Saudi Arabia in 1925 as two countries and then 32 as one country, unified country, until 1979, we had a very good relationship with Iran. Our problem isn't with Iran or the Iranian people, it's with this particular government. And so after the 79 revolution, we didn't shut you know, our relationship with the particular Iranian regime, they shut us out and then didn't get better. Now, our behavior towards Iran, because we consider Iran an existential threat, may not go any way into improving that scenario. But we've had talks with them before in the late 2000s. We had a very good round of talks um, and real development with two presidents, Rafsanjani and Khatami. And there was very positive talks. Something happened and they completely shifted. And so we find dealing with them quite difficult because there's no consistency. Um, we are quite consistent about what we want, which is just an open, healthy, non-rival relationship. Um, but entrenched in the constitution of the, the uh, Islamic Republic is the export of the revolution, not just to the region, to the world. And we feel that in reality because they're on our border and we see activities that don't give us confidence in uh, the, the particular behavior of the regime. So it, it would take very little for us to have a good relationship because we think it's normal. Uh, I think the problem thus far has been on the other side. Um, and I think we could do something, but it would require a shift on their side. And Saudi Arabia and the Taliban have had old alliances, the last time the Taliban ran Afghanistan between 96 and 2001, Saudi Arabia was one of the only three countries in the world to officially recognize them. But what does the new Taliban regime mean for Saudi? But, but I would just um, give a more nuanced uh, idea of the relationship. We never had an alliance with the Taliban. When the Taliban took over, 
we were going to cut relations with them principally because they were supporting Al-Qaeda. Um, and Al-Qaeda at the time was a group that hardly anyone knew about. Um, some of the you know, young Saudis when they went who ended up fighting in Afghanistan in the 80s and the late 90s. And in fact, the particularly dangerous element came from those who went after the war, um, ended in 88, and then developed a very, very um, austere, violent belief in what Islam should be politically. Uh, you know, people like Osama bin Laden ended up thinking uh, along those lines. And there's a number of reasons we don't have time to get into them all. I'd have to do a psychology study, and I'm, I'm certainly no social scientist. But we wanted to repatriate these people for a number of reasons. And, you know, you say that and people think, oh, you were going to get rid of them. No, we, were, we have one of the, today in Saudi, one of the most successful rehabilitation program for people who have fallen into Islamic extremism. We have about an 80% success rate of reintroducing people into society as normal human beings who become fruitful members of society who had really way out their um, violent tendencies. So in the, eight, in the 90s, we wanted to bring these people back and the Taliban were resistant. And in fact, in consultation with our allies in the West, it was thought, it's best you keep an open channel with them so that someone can talk to them. But it didn't take long in 98, 99, um, we were trying to get Osama bin Laden back. Him we wanted to throw in jail. Um, and we had uh, two or three meetings with the, the Taliban leadership, Mullah Umar, who eventually said, I will consider it, and then eventually said, I will give him to you. And when we went to sort of go collect him, they refused to give him up, and we actually cut our relationship with them, and people don't realize that. Uh, sorry for the correction, but it's important that people know the perspective. In the modern world, we're playing a much more wait and see um, uh, game because we are not going to fall into the same mistake. People have recommended you keep a relationship with them so we can talk to them. And we remember how that ended up last time. Everyone blamed us for everything they did, which we don't want to get into again. Uh, we are concerned with the direction they're taking, particularly as we are now actively promoting a much more moderate um, um, belief in how Islam should be presented. We don't think what they're doing is positive for the Afghan people. I think there's, you know, it's not just, you know, women who have had a, a taste of liberation and a different world and education that are being um, restricted. Everyone is. Everyone is being treated poorly, particularly those who they believe are, were traitors for dealing with, with foreigners. It's not a positive world. I mean, I hope the Taliban are different, but thus far we're not seeing it. I don't really know where that takes us, but it's again, it's up to the Taliban to do something to convince us that it's worth having a relationship with them. And I think everyone else is on that page as well, to be honest. And you spoke earlier about um, your friends in the West. Mm -hmm. um, tensions between Western and Eastern powers are rising. It's, Saudi has been a long-standing ally of the West, but recently there's been a sort of greater shift to the East, particularly to Russia. What do you think Saudi's future is with the West? Well, I think um, historically, Saudi Arabia has, there's a difference between relationships. It's the difference between a friend and an acquaintance. Um, where we have friends, we have been loyal to that friendship. So we were friends with the United States, France, Germany, Britain, when it wasn't fashionable or popular in our part of the world. And just because it wasn't fashionable or popular doesn't mean we stopped being friends openly. Um, there's, you know, that sense of loyalty. We stood together in tough times. We'll stand together in good times and we'll continue standing together unless we decide not to. Um, and I don't see that changing, but at times we do feel that now that times are bad on our end, nobody's standing with us. And it, it does feel, um, slightly unfair, but that's life. Um, I wouldn't say we are shifting at all towards the East. We are just very pragmatic where it is 
you know, useful. We have discussions with the, the Russians because we're both big oil producing nations. We have a lot of disagreement with the Russians when it comes to production of oil and how we, we regulate that market. But we have a discussion with them because it makes sense. Um, we have a lot of ties with China and Chinese companies because we feel that there is a benefit to both sides. They're also the biggest market for oil, which makes them economically important for us. But that doesn't mean we are shifting away from our friends. Now, what happens in 100 years is impossible to know, but we stick with our friends through good and bad, and I think we'll continue to do that. Hopefully they stick with us. And do you think the modernization of Saudi that we've been speaking about will bring Saudi closer to the West? I mean, I don't see why not. I, I would say that the changes that we're making in Saudi Arabia today are simply positive. They're not Western or Eastern. They're just the right thing to do. And if you're doing the right thing, people who are also doing the right thing will find um, space with each other. And at the moment, it is obviously much more in line with what's happening in the Western world, though I wouldn't describe the changes we're making in Saudi Arabia as purely Western changes. There are Saudi changes for a Saudi society and a Saudi way of life. Where things work from the West, we're happy to use that. Where they work from the East, we're happy to use that. Um, we're pragmatic people. And in a, on a more personal note, in your time, you've worked at the MUN as an ambassador to Germany, an ambassador to the UK. How has your approach to diplomacy changed as you've uh, worked in all of these different places? Funny enough, I think I've become less diplomatic. <laughs> um, what, I would, what I would describe it as is the world we live in, as I said earlier, moves pretty fast. Um, and you've got to try and stay ahead of the changes that are coming at you. And, you know, you look at the world today, and if, if you're only going to deal with what's happening in the Ukraine, you're going to miss a lot of what, uh, what's happening elsewhere. In, in the Middle East, if you're only dealing with Lebanon, you're going to miss a lot of what's happening elsewhere. And then you also realize that every one of these issues in, is intertwined. And you've got to have the bandwidth to deal with them all. You've got to have the bandwidth to be able to focus enough time everywhere to deal with the collective. Now, that's not easy. If you're going to simply be um, diplomatic and use words that have no meaning, um, which I have to say I learned here writing essays, try and make them as long as possible by saying as little as possible, um, you don't get very far in solving the problems. And being a diplomat in particular, at the end of the day, is just solving problems. So what I, the way I would describe the transition is I used to be um, straightforward. I used to be di diplomatically straightforward. And now I'm straightforwardly diplomatic. And I'm much more direct in what I say, but you have to make sure that you don't upset people in the process. But it's much better to get your point across and be direct in diplomacy than to spend a lot of time getting lost before you get to where you want to go. I'd like to make sure that we have plenty of time for audience questions. So if you do have a question, if you raise your membership card, and we have a microphone, um, I recognize the member in the gray at the back. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Um, just to touch on a couple of things that you said sort of linked to the end when you're talking about relations with both East and West and at the start when you're talking about Saudi Arabia's responsibility to the whole of the Islamic world. Um, I was wondering what both your personal opinion and uh, Saudi Arabian policy is on the plight of the Uyghur Muslims of East Turkestan. Um, thank you. Um... It's not good. Um, again, we have a very strict policy of non-intervention in other countries. And so we don't get involved in other countries' domestic issues. What we do, um, and I'm not involved in, in um, that diplomatic world at the moment, because obviously my focus is here, we do often communicate and, and talk to countries where we think the wrong things are happening, but we do it offline and we do it 
behind the scenes and we do it directly. Um, so I'm pretty sure we would have had a chat with the Chinese, but we also, it's a complicated issue and we have no shortage of complicated issues in Saudi Arabia, which we know what's going on and we don't talk about it because it's our nature. We're never sure if that's always the case somewhere else. So it's difficult to judge every situation without all knowledge. And we've been on the receiving end of, as I said earlier, excellent analysis of what's happening in Saudi Arabia, which is incorrect. Um, and I can give you examples of that. I'll give you an example of one. We had um, situations where um, someone is arrested for an issue. What's reported is they had done this and they're now arrested. And they link one thing with another. And yes, it's true they were arrested here and they were arrested here, but this arrest had nothing to do with that one. And you can tell the story without telling the middle and that doesn't tell you the journey. Now, from what I've seen in, in what's happening to, to the Uyghurs, it's not positive, but it's very difficult to get information out of China and quick snapshots are dangerous things to use as evidence of a bigger picture, unless you're sure. And like a lot of things, if people are so sure, really convince me. At the moment, my feeling is it's not positive. And I think that we would probably, if that's the way we felt, uh, you know, sort of our specialists in that part of the world, I'm pretty sure we would have talked to the Chinese about it. And I'm, you know, I'd like to think that they would have given us um, credible um, uh, explanation as, as to what's happening. But it's not a world I'm involved in, so I can't say definitively anything. But that's generally how we do conduct uh, our diplomacy. Uh, I recognize the member with the green hoodie. Uh, scarf. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, Your Royal Highness. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned in your speech this idea of acquaintances and friends, and you were just about um, answering in that question, ask, uh, talking about um, talking to nations behind closed doors and so on. And, and on this theme, I wanted to ask you what you see Saudi Arabia's relations with Israel currently and going forward. Is that an uh, acquaintance or is that going to be a friendship in the near future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my hope is that it becomes a friendship because if it becomes a friendship, that means a lot of other issues will have been resolved. Uh, I know that, that that's a standard diplomatic answer, so forgive me for occasionally slipping back into my role, but I think certainly in the Arab world and probably in the Islamic world, we will be, if not the last, one of the last countries to recognize Israel officially. And the main reason for that is we're probably one of the biggest prizes for a relationship and a solution. Um, and for us to take that step, one, we have to make sure that the Palestinian people would be happy for it because we've defended the Palestinians since the, um, the, the conflict started in 48 and before that, actually. There was an interesting, and it, you know, it won't be popular, uh, with a lot of people, but it's actually a very logical conversation considering the time that it was had. In 1945, 46, um, President Roosevelt met with King Abdul Aziz of Saudi and they had a long conversation on relationship and the future of the Middle East post the Second World War. And one of the discussions that Roosevelt wanted to have with King Abdul Aziz was um, the issue of the Jewish people at large and, and how to deal with their involvement in the Holy Land. And what he said was, that, you know, the Jewish people have had a very, very um, difficult time under Nazi Germany. They've been persecuted, they've been murdered, they've almost been eliminated, and we would, we would like to do what we can for them. And we'd like your support to resettle them in um, the Palestinian territories under the mandate, uh, the British mandate. And he said, well, I don't know why you're asking me. Why don't you ask the Palestinian people? That has nothing to do with me. And so the reply was, well, you're the king of Saudi Arabia. You have high standing. Your support would go a long way. And he said, well, look, if the Palestinian people come to me and say, we're happy with this, I will support it wholeheartedly. Um, 
but I have a feeling that they're not going to. So you better sort this out quickly, otherwise you're gonna have conflict. That's one. He said, if you want my solution, take the best part of Germany and give it to them, and then worry about Palestine later, which actually is, I mean, is a very logical, old-fashioned solution. Um, and understandable why nobody wanted to follow up on that, but we have been supporters of the Palestinians since the beginning of the issue. We have a responsibility in some sense to the Islamic world because of Mecca and Medina and Jerusalem being the third holiest site. So I think to bring that on would require quite a big ask from Israel. Um, we were nearly there in 2008 when uh, King Abdullah VI, 2006, brought initially the Arab peace proposal, which was for all Arab states to recognize Israel, and then that didn't go far. So King Abdullah went and lobbied the OIC, which is 57, 58 Islamic countries who all agreed to support open relations with Israel if they went back to the 1967 borders. And nothing happened. So. I don't see where we're gonna go with it. We, we're very allied in some of the direction, our policies towards Iran, in particular, we find ourselves in the same boat. Um, and hence, you've seen some of the other Gulf states open a relationship with the Abraham Accords and, and some African countries, Sudan, etc. It's not a huge step, but you've got to remember what I said earlier about Saudi Arabia having the part of its constituencies, 1.7 billion Muslims around the world. And they have an opinion. And until that opinion shifts significantly, upsetting and alienating a significant portion of that population is a very difficult step for us to take, regardless of the possible pragmatic benefits of having an open relationship. I think, again, doing the right thing may not always be the right thing, um, depending on what you consider the right thing. Um, so I, you know, I think it's possible in time, but it'll take a lot of change first, on both sides. Uh, I recognize the member just. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for coming. Um, so my question deals with uh, uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. So with Iran, you know, allegedly uh, uh, that was on track to form it, to build a nuclear weapon. There was talk that uh, other states in the Middle East might uh, try to um, get a bomb of their own. I'm wondering, what's your opinion of the likelihood of that? And do your instincts tell you that, you know, if it is likely that there might be a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, do you think it might be resolved uh, diplomatically or by conflict? Well, hopefully, if... Um if they're developed, it's not a conflict. That would be pretty disastrous for all of us. Um, increasingly, I'm, and I think sort of, not just us in Saudi, but more people are starting to believe that the Iranians are not interested in anything but developing a weapon. I can't speak for the, the mindset in Iran. It's a very complicated place to get to understand the leadership and the leadership structures. I mean, you can understand how it works, but who thinks what and who does what is very complicated in Iran. Um, I can tell you that I'm pretty certain if they developed a nuclear weapon, you would see us, the UAE, and probably one or two more countries definitely go down that route, um, which I don't think is helpful or useful for anybody. You know, the Middle East at the moment is constantly on a tinderbox. And accidental conflict with nuclear weapons involved is very dangerous. We've never had, as far as I can think, a conflict between two nuclear armed powers, an open conflict. Um, and when you are in conflict, you can make some very, very poor decisions. Um, particularly when you think you're about to lose. So I don't want to see that happen, but if it does happen, I, I don't think we have a choice but to move in that direction. Um, although 
you know, the truth has to be said. If you look at the Middle East and if you look at Iran, there is no rational way that Iran can use a nuclear weapon against Saudi Arabia. Because if it attacks the eastern province, it's close enough to Iran that it, the fallout comes back to Iran. If it attacks the anywhere else, you're far too close to Medina and Mecca, which as an Islamic theocracy would be unthinkable. Um, equally, they can't attack Israel because if they use a nuclear weapon in Israel, they destroy Jerusalem. So the actual nuclear threat in the region is quite low, unless you want to destroy everyone. Um, which is a possibility, I suppose. Um, but even at the high point of the, the Cold War, when you had big extremes in Russia and the United States that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, at the very end of it, neither side wanted that to, to lead to a nuclear war. As hard line as anyone may have been, nobody wanted it to go that far. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to try and avoid the problem at all. But this is, again, why I think Iran wants a nuclear weapon. You've got to remember, if one is going to be fair, Iran is a country that sees itself surrounded by Sunni enemies on all fronts. Pakistan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, some with big, powerful militaries, others with a lot of wealth. It's naturally going to be defensive all the time. A defensive rationale I can understand. And I can even understand, to some extent, the the and though they deny it, their policy of creating much chaos in the region to keep everyone unstable, which helps keep them safe. Because if you're concerned with your own problems, you're not concerned with their problems. There are only two reasons for that. One, um, they want to expand, as I said earlier, or they, they really believe we threaten them. Now, I can tell you for a fact that Saudi Arabia has no intention, no requirement, no desire ever to get involved in Iran other than in a positive way. I mean, the economic benefits of a relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia are unbelievable. That is a bigger benefit than an, a relationship with Israel, for instance. Um, and I just can't see why we can't get there. We're very happy to do so, and that's evidenced by our past. We're the same government we have been for 100 years, which I must say is remarkable in our region and it, particularly if you start comparing it, we're older than the French government, the German government. Uh, we're older than every government in the region, apart from maybe Oman. Uh, the, and there's an argument to be made there, although there were some changes. Um, the Russian government, I mean, pick almost any big country in the world. Our government has been more stable than any of them, um, which is a remarkable achievement. We'll take one final brief question from uh, the member in the coat, just in the middle of the back row. Thank you so much for speaking to us tonight, Your Royal Highness. My question is, how would you forecast your relationship with Western Europe to be like in the future, and how would you predict your personal role to evolve? So the second part was, how do I predict the- Your place in the world oh, to evolve. Um, hopefully you mean Saudi Arabia, not my personal place. Um, the relationship with Western Europe, I, I mean, I think Western Europe is, is struggling at the moment. Um, with Britain leaving the EU, uh, Britain played a significant and important moderating role on the European Union, um, principally because Britain has generally a much more centrist government historically. Even the various extremes left or right have been much more center-orientated center than much of Europe. Europe much more sways occasion right or left. Um, and that moderating effect leaving Europe has complicated things because it's come at a time when there's instability in the most stable elements in Europe, principally France and Germany. Germany for the first time having significant internal political difficulties in forming a government, which they have done for the last almost four years. Um, and France going through a very difficult election coming up, that means the, the politics versus governance scale of where their governments are is skewed heavily to the political. 
rather than the governance. Can Europe survive that? I don't know, because without those two anchors, Europe becomes a much more complicated game. And if Europe falls apart as a union, um, it changes the nature of our economic relationships with Europe. It changes the nature of our political relationships with Europe. We have to then redevelop a, a direct relationship with every European country, which is a long drawn out process. And you know, those circumstances, without sounding doom and gloom, could lead to minor conflict in Europe, which is another problem. So, you know, my hope is Europe can sort its act, get its act together. I think we would have a positive relationship always with Europe. I don't see why not. Um, sometimes I wish the Europeans would listen a bit more to what we're telling them. They don't like to listen very much. They like to tell you what to do. Um, and I think as a result, Saudi Arabia has an incredibly important role to play in the world. It is, um, as I mentioned a number of times, the center of the Islamic world physically, which means that 1.7 billion Muslims are looking to Saudi Arabia, not as a religious leader, because it's also important to, to, to say that my government has never ever claimed a religious leadership. We go out of our way as a government to say we have no role to play in the development of religion. Now we influence our religious scholars, definitely, um, but that is not the end all be all of religion. And the royal family, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, again, goes out of its way to say it's not related to the prophet, which is a unique thing among leadership in the Middle East. Every leadership in the history of the Middle East has always said they're descended from the prophet because it gives them a legitimacy of some sort. We've said, look, we're just a tribal bunch of Bedouins who happened to win the war. Um, and at the moment, our people like us, though, Long may that last, but that may not always be the case. And so we don't play a religious leadership role. What we do is we bring the Islamic world to a, a place to try and unify them. And that is our ability. We have a convening power over the Islamic world. So that gives us an importance. We're obviously the, the most important oil producing nation in the world. And while that is on its way out, um, it plays a big role, the development of energy. It also gives us the catalyst to develop where we want to. So our Minister of Energy recently said that Saudi Arabia is looking at moving from being an oil producing nation to an energy producing nation. And what we want to do, uh, and what we're already doing, I mean, we produce a lot of hydrogen in Saudi. We're building the largest green hydrogen plant in the world in the Northwest. And at the moment, what we're doing behind the scenes is trying to create a hydrogen industry so that all this hydrogen we're producing replaces oil at the end of the day. Um, but we're also looking at ways to be able to use fossil fuels, uh, particularly oil and, and gas, in non-carbon emitting fashion. Um, you know, for us in, in Saudi, to use natural gas to make hydrogen is a no-brainer because we can take the um, carbon or all emissions from that and put it right back where the gas came from in the first place. And those um, um, fissures in the ground hold gas very well. They would hold carbon very well. So it's, an, it's a no-brainer to produce something clean and put the dirt back where it came from, if you like. Um, so we have a very important role, I believe, to play in energy. We're also, you, you couldn't find a more uh, perfect place to develop solar energy and wind in the north. Um, and we are at the center of three continents, literally in the middle of three continents. It's a perfect logistics location for anyone seeking to communicate. And if you look at when, Saudi, when Arabia has flourished historically, it's always when there have been trade routes. And where Arabia failed is when those trade routes found other ways around. Um, so, you know, we can capitalize a lot on that. Plus we have, I mean, like a lot of the developing world, but I think we have an advantage in that we started educating our population well earlier than some. So we have an amazing resource in our human capital. Um, I'm not just saying that because some of them are here, but genuinely there's a lot of young people who are very well educated in Saudi. And that gives us a great 
uh, source to build from. So there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, to think that Saudi Arabia will play a large role. Also, and uh, this is a small plug uh, for, for monarchy, we, we have a stable government where our government can make decisions for the next 20 years. Um, and also make responsible. We don't need to worry about, so I remember in our negotiations about net zero goals for 2050, you know, one of the things that our negotiating team said was, listen, um, you guys make promises for 2050, but none of you will be around in 2050 to live up to them. And if your countries fail, nobody's gonna point the finger at anyone because you'll be long gone. Our leadership will still be there in 2050. So the commitments they make, they take seriously. And I think that's, a, that's a, a unique position to be in. Well, Your Royal Highness, thank you so much for joining us. We'll finish with the question that we ask every speaker at the end of our event, which is if you could give um, our audience just one thing to think about for this week, what would that be? That's a very good question. Um, it's too early for finals, so don't think about them. You've got plenty of time. I would think if you look at the world as it is at the moment, and you, you see the conflict zones, Ukraine, Lebanon, Yemen. Um, you look, we've recently had conf conflict in Azerbaijan and Armenia. We've got difficult scenarios all over the world, really. I mean, there's no shortage. Pick where you like. You can put your finger almost anywhere on the map and find a conflict within a, a short distance. M much of the reason countries end up where they are is because it's not because they don't talk to each other, it's because they don't talk to each other meaningfully enough. And dialogue is unbelievably important. And here, in this um, world you're living in as students, it is the most important place to be able to have dialogue. You can talk to each other with very little ramifications outside of feelings, and feelings are important, but there are some more important things out there use the opportunity to talk to each other, to argue with each other, to discuss with each other, and to learn from each other. The most important things I learned when I was a student here were not in tutorials and lectures. Um, they were sitting with friends of mine who were studying different subjects. They gave me insights and points of views that I never thought of. And that is the best way to develop, is find someone else who disagrees with you and challenge yourself by challenging them because if you can't defend your point of view, it's probably wrong. Um, and the best way to figure that out is to talk to someone who doesn't agree with you. The ones that agree with you are not the problem. Um, and this is a wonderful place to do so. You've got amazing places to do it in. You have time to do it in. Particularly, I mean, I can tell you one thing I really miss is the holidays. Six weeks. Um, for, for um, Christmas and Easter, and then almost three months in the summer, four months in the summer. It was amazing. Uh, so enjoy that time to be who you are and develop yourselves, because you'll never get a chance to do it again. So once you hit the real world, it's too fast. And um, once you have children, it gets even faster, I can tell you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please join me in thanking His Royal Highness.